Hello, Maya students. We're going to learn about cameras and uh, some effects. We're going to learn how to add a renderable camera, uh, use the render settings to render that camera, um, and learn their options. We're going to learn how to add special rendering effects such as glow, depth of field, motion blur, uh, and ray tracing in an animation. Okay, let's go ahead and load the glow.ma scene into Maya and talk about this scene a little bit. Um, let's just switch to the perspective view and I'll leave the outliner open. I'm going to select the point light and do a quick... Uh, hold on a second, hold on. Make sure there's no cameras created. The first thing I'm going to do actually is create a camera. So we'll go to create cameras and there's three different types you can make. Mostly we're just going to use camera and camera and aim. Basically camera is just a freestanding camera. Camera and aim comes along with an aim node and if you move that wherever you move that aim node around the camera will point to it. So, whichever one you want is up to you. For this one, I'm going to create a camera without an aim node. And what I usually do once we've got our camera um, created, looks like I've still got the other one here. Let's get rid of that. What I usually do is I'm going to typically set the top panel to um, go to panels, perspective, camera, you know, whichever camera you're using. And from here on out, um, the renders are going to come from the camera, not the perspective view. The perspective view is now a modeling tool. And so I'm going to put this on shaded view with lighting and shadows. And I will select the point light. If you can't select it visually, just select it in the outliner. So go to light effects here under the attribute editor. If it's not already open, just click on that tab. And we're going to add a light glow to this by clicking here. And uh, we won't see this in the in any view on the workspace, so I'm going to do an IPR render. And I think I need to take my camera over a little bit. You can tumble this and zoom in and out just like a perspective view, but just be aware that it moves your camera around when you're doing that. See that? So, let's do an IPR view and, and drag a square around the star there. <coughs> okay, and I'm going to select my point light and go over to Optical Effects 1. And there's a few different glow types you can choose and they do different things. Um, essentially, just as always, don't worry about specifics. Just play with it until you get something you like here. And you can have as many star points as you like. So if you want 10 star points, you can get 10 star points. You can turn on lens flare and get a, get a flare on the lens. <coughs> So, and then you can put a halo on there. And you can basically play with these settings until you get something interesting. Now select the planet sphere. and go to Lambert 2 and in the special effects under the Lambert material I'm going to add a glow. 
let's increase the glow intensity to 0.8 which is pretty high um, and we'll put a, a new square that includes the planet there and for the heck of it just do the whole thing so that's what glow looks like with the glow on it creates a foggy kind of glow around that and you can also hide the source and just leave the glow behind so that all you actually see is the glow and if you want to you can put a texture on that for example a fractal texture which will break it up to some degree as you can see there's just the glow and there's the glow with the planet so that's an additive blend it, it builds up more and more light with with um, as you layer on top of it so so it gets brighter and brighter okay it's time to move on to depth of field let's open the file called depth of field so depth of field is a visual cue in photography if you have a shallow depth of field I'll show you what that looks like you've all seen it you've got a small bit of the image in focus and everything else is blurred there's a good one okay so um, it's really important to understand something about depth of field uh, when you bring it down like this and make your depth of field shallow it implies a certain um, scale which is going to be small you don't use shallow depth of field on a wide scale image so for example if you do use shallow depth of field on a wide scale image your um, your brain will tell you that it is not a wide scale image it is a small scale image and it makes everything look like miniature toys I don't know if that's really the best these are not bad but I'm trying to find a really good one this is a, a photographic effect called tilt shift and by forcing a shallow depth of field over a wide scale image it gives the impression that the uh, the scale is very small that it's that you're looking at little toys so and the reason for that is because um, because of the way your eye works and because of the way it communicates with your brain if you for example hold your hand up to your face you'll notice that everything in the distance goes blurry um, if you take your hand away then that that shallow depth of field so to speak on your eye becomes a wide depth of field because now you're you're focused on a wide scale so if something has a shallow depth of field like this your brain is going to say it must be right in front of my face and therefore must be small um, it's just how optics in our brain work biologically so anyway with all that said use depth of field correctly please and let's talk about how to turn it on so um, let's create a camera let's check and see if one already exists go to the outliner okay no camera so let's create camera and I'm gonna go to the four up view and I'm gonna make this camera one here and let's just frame it up 
in a way that we can see all of the chess pieces. Something along that line will be fine. And let's, uh, I need to see some details about these objects. So I'm going to do um, display, heads up display, um, object details. And that's going to give us some information about the object. And when I select something, I can get the distance from camera. And that will help us choose a focal distance. So if you want to focus on the queen, mine is at 20.527 units from the camera. Yours may be different. Um, I'm going to go back to the outliner and select the camera. And as you can see, um, there is a focal length and Uh, focal distance as well as a depth of field tab under the film back tab. So I'm going to turn on depth of field and I'm going to make the focus distance 26 units. I can't even remember what the number was now. 20 units. That's what I want. Or 20.5. Okay, so the f-stop has to do with um, how far the shutter opens, or how far the uh, iris opens when the shutter clicks. And an f-stop of 5.6 is about average. If you go lower in number, it opens further, and if you go higher in number, it opens a little less or it comes down quite a bit if you turn the f-stop way up. I cannot tell you, it is not in the scope of this class to explain everything about cameras, um, but it is good to know how cameras work and, and read up on that to understand what these settings mean. It does simulate a real camera pretty well. And there's plugins that you can get that can take it even further. So. Let me get, do a quick render here. I'm going to do an IPR render. That's not enough resolution to tell what I want to tell. Let's bring that up a little bit. Let's go to the rendering settings, or the rendering menu. And I do have to talk about rendering settings too. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. Let's go to, let's go to render settings. I'm going to take that up to HD 1080. And you have to make sure that you are rendering your camera view, not your perspective view. We're not using that anymore as, as a rendering camera. So depth of field, like everything else, will increase your render time. And it looks like my distance is just a tiny bit off, 20.527. And I'm going to bring the focus region up. I'm going to double it. So as you can see, the queen is just about in focus here. I'm not quite sure why it's not in perfect focus. I think I'm going to try fiddling with that in an IPR a little bit.
So there it is at 20.57. Um, it should be pretty exact, and I don't know why it's not, but it's close enough. That should be exactly in focus. But I think you get the idea. So let's do an open scene and go to 3D Motion Blur. Close the render view and go to the four up view. As you can see, we have four different views here, and let's create a camera just to stay in the habit since we're doing that all the time now. We're going to always use a camera, and let's go to camera one. We'll just get whatever angle you want here. And if you press play, we haven't really talked about animation yet, but you'll see that this is an animated spinning helicopter blade. So let's go into the render settings and under the Maya software tab, under quality, I'm going to go to 3D motion blur production and I'm going to come down here to Motion Blur. And I'm going to turn on Motion Blur. There's two flavors of Motion Blur, 3D and 2D. So 3D, if I render it, it will compute the Motion Blur in a realistic manner, the most realistic manner possible, and apply it like it's a shutter effect. If I go to 2D Motion Blur, um, in most cases, it's going to look almost exactly the same, but it's a post effect after the render happens. So it's actually a, a little less technically realistic. Um, it's a little faster on render and a little easier on, on the computer. So if you have um, a good result from 2D, you should use that. Otherwise, if you have a need for 3D, you should use that. Usually a 3D would be used when something is, thing is coming towards or away from the camera. And you can also um, set certain camera settings here or, or blur length if you want a longer blur. Um, it's not really moving that fast so that's a lot of blur for that but um, that's up to you how you want to do it.